Hello everybody. I am asked on an almost a daily basis, James, what car is it that I should buy if at one o'clock I need to pick up a Billy bookcase, at three o'clock I have to teach some geography, and then at five o'clock I've got a track day? Well, the answer is obvious, of course. It's this, the Volvo V70R. to admit that as a card carrying and committed petrol head I try and see the good in all things and this doesn't mean that I have to like every car out there but I do try my best to understand every car out there and I know that even if maybe it's not the thing for me it probably is for somebody else but when it comes to Volvos I struggle and I'm not saying they're bad cars are far from it but what I can't get my head around is just how ludicrously popular they have become with not just petrol heads but young petrol heads this to me is something I just I just can't process they're not beautiful gorgeous things to behold as say an Alfa Romeo would be they haven't got an aspirational badge like BMW Mercedes or Porsche nor are they generally the last word in refinement comfort or luxury like say a Jaguar would be however in spite of all of this not only do they have fans they have many and very dedicated fans this being said, over the last few years, thanks to the many kind Volvo fans out there, I have had the opportunity to sample a number of them, including some classic stuff from the 80s and then more modern stuff like, say, the C30, the V60 Polestar and the XC90. And all of them have been, in their own way, decent cars, but I don't think I've ever come away loving any of them. But what I'm driving today is a very special Volvo and it comes from an important time in the company's past because this was the last car developed by the firm before they were taken over by Ford who acquired them in 1999 this model being launched in 2000 as the second to wear the V70 nameplate the first having launched in 1996 and this one lasting until 2007 when it was then replaced by the third generation that platform is known as P2 and it was also shared with the S60, the S80, the XC70 and the aforementioned XC90 which was the last car to use it going out of production in 2014 though I believe in China they did continue producing a variant of it known as the XC Classic but we never got that. And I must admit that even though this is a car that I have given the sum total of no thought whatsoever over the last few years, the moment I laid eyes on it and Marv rolled into the car park with it, I started thinking, you know, I can kind of see why people like this. First off, the exterior styling. While sure, you wouldn't call it pretty, it does have a distinctive look about it. Now this particular one, being a 2005, is the very last of the pre-facelift cars. Shortly after, the styling was changed and so were the mechanical specifications. And I think I do prefer the look of the facelifts, but this still, it has its own appeal. And one of the reasons that Marv wanted to buy a car such as this is because, as a young man, he remembered seeing the mighty 850 estate herring round the tracks of Britain, making a name for itself in the touring cars. And this V70R is effectively a slightly newer take on that same formula, a spicy Volvo estate. It also happened to launch just about the time that Marv was getting his driving license, and so then this was the car that he lusted after. And on the subject of that styling, you're never really going to mistake it for anything else, are you? In fact, even one of its stylists said that it's half E-type and half transit, because at the front, it is quite sleek, quite sexy. These cars had a drag coefficient of just 0.30. That's reasonably sleek. Yet at the back, it is all very much business. 
its nice square classic Volvo shape, meaning that it gives you every single centimetre of boot space that it can. And I think it's fair to say that I was even more impressed when I opened the door and I was greeted with an interior that was far more upmarket than I was expecting it to be. Now, granted, age has done a little bit to diminish its impact, but even so, all of the leather, the contrast stitch, the beautiful shapes in here, they add up to a feeling of a cabin that is certainly premium. This definitely feels like something a step above your Fords, your Vauxhalls and their equivalent. OK, maybe it's not quite as high-end as, say, a Jaguar, but nor is it a million miles off. I should also give special mention to the seats, which in all Volvos are generally excellent, and these have to be just about some of the comfiest I've ever experienced. They have electric adjustment, memory, and of course heating, a Scandinavian must. The windows are naturally electric all around, visibility is generally very good. The B pillar, though on the large side, is still far enough back that you only have to crook your neck slightly when doing a lifesaver. The driving position is very comfortable, very natural, and this is a car that you are instantly at ease with. It really is a wonderful place to spend your time. I also adore this colour combination of passion red over, I'm sure he called it sand. I mean, it's beige, basically, but it is lovely. And I have been told that tomorrow this car may be going off to a new owner because, regrettably, though he loves it, Marv just doesn't have the space to keep it and all of his others. A fleet which includes a Tesla, that is his daily driver, and an S80 V8. And if you'd like to see that on the channel, hit the comments down below and tell me. And yes, I have already asked him if I could borrow it for a review because those are seriously, seriously cool cars. Yet he tells me it is this which gets all the attention. And I can see why, because the colour scheme, first off, is stunning. This, incidentally, is an import, and we believe this might be a Japanese market-only exterior colour. And honestly, the colour alone, I think, would be reason enough to import one of these, but this is actually something I'm seeing an increasing amount of today. Cars that we could get here that are being imported anyway, simply because the condition of many of them in Japan is just a little bit better than the ones that stayed here in Britain. Have you recently been on Auto Trader window shopping for your next Scandinavian love affair? Well, if so, don't forget to use Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase. A Car Vertical search will tell you if a car has suffered a major accident, been used as a taxi, involved in fire or theft, or has outstanding finance. You can find out all of this in just 60 seconds with only a registration or a VIN. And for 20% off the service, don't forget to use my code JM. So then, for those not quite so familiar with the land of Volvo, what exactly is this and what marks it out as being so special? So this car's a member of the second generation of V70. Landed in 2000, discontinued in 2007. Compared with its predecessor, it was an evolution of the theme, so classic Volvo boxy thing. Oh, terrible, terrible turning circle, by the way. Apparently a P2 platform issue. I mean, this is really some of the worst I think I've ever experienced. But that aside, it does have plenty of good things, including the fact that they used a lot more bonding as opposed to welding for this, so it is a considerably stiffer car than its predecessor. It is still just about the right size for me, 4.7 metres long, about 1.8 metres wide, meaning that it is practically large, but not so big you can't park it in a regular British parking space. It feels nice and at home on roads like this. The car also came exclusively with five-cylinder engines. No matter whether you went for a petrol, for which they had both turbo and non-turbo, a diesel, or the bifuel, you got a five-pot. In the early days, the diesel was actually one bought in from VW, but that was soon then replaced by Volvo's own in-house D5. But of course, the engines that most people are now interested in are the petrols. 
and the range topper was to be found in the front of this, the V70R, where you have a 2.5 litre version with the high pressure turbo and it makes 300 horsepower. Combined with this five speed automatic gearbox, it then makes 258 pounds feet of torque or with the later six speed that came in with the facelift, 295 pounds feet, and that's the same for the six speed manual, which sadly is very, very rare indeed. You also got larger brakes, gorgeous 18 inch alloy wheels, a few other subtle styling cues to mark this out as something a little bit more special, and three-way adaptive dampers tuned by Olins, which are currently in their comfort setting. You then beyond that have sport and advanced. But even in its comfort setting, it's an oddly set up affair, this car. Very, very strange indeed. The chassis is at once somewhat wallowy, you do that with it and you can feel the whole thing pitch and roll but it's also quite harsh maybe it's the body structure maybe it's a function of it being an estate and therefore pretty much hollow but when you do go over a pothole or manhole cover or the like the whole thing shudders and shakes and oh my life this turning circle is really poor but let's put it into sport mode i have been warned that advanced really is quite firm going to use the manual mode for the gearbox and let's see what this is like when you really want to press on this very curious indeed I tried sport for a little bit but I'm now in advanced mode and the difference between all of them isn't enormous I experienced this when I drove the XC70 a while back based on the same platform confused character this car very very confused now potentially somewhat optimistically Volvo actually felt the need to fit the R with all-wheel drive it is a Haldex system, so I believe for the majority of the time it is front biased and then as and when required can send a bit of power to the back. But honestly, that doesn't feel particularly necessary, certainly not on a day like today. 300 horsepower, 258 pounds foot of torque and this car weighs nearly 1.8 tonnes. <laughs> Even with my foot absolutely welded to the floor, the performance isn't what you'd call stellar. This is a car that seems happiest at sort of seven tenths. It's not got out of shape in the bends, and if anything, actually, for having fun. I think advanced maybe is the mode that you want, but then it does that. It's just phenomenally harsh over those little imperfections in the road in a way that no sports car I really drive ever is. I mean, I can see my camera being shaken about. That's that's not right. And you do sort of get into a groove with it, but I'm driving this thing and I just feel like I'm being cruel to it. It just, it just doesn't like it. It doesn't want it. The steering, I actually quite enjoy. It's got an interesting feel about it. It's got a real positive action to it. Reminds me a little bit of classic Citroen steering. The weighting is reasonably light, not masses of feel and feedback to it, but it's got a nice action, I'll give it that. The brakes are fine, they're light, plenty of travel in the pedal so you can modulate them fairly precisely, and the engine is its good enough. This is also a fairly rare example of a V70R in that it is entirely standard. But I just, I'm just failing to gel with it, I, I really am. Oh. Yeah, went a little bit wider than intended there. Does it hold on? I mean, grip level's good enough. Tires beginning to chirp there. They're not premium ones, nor are they enormous, but it's fine. I mean, it does the job, but I can see why Marv tends to drive it just gently and easily most of the time. 
This though then begs the question, why you would buy a V70R? If you want just a nice, decent, comfortable experience, surely the regular V70 in one of the nicer trims is going to do that for you. This, I just, I just don't get it. And I'm sure it makes a lot of sense if you're looking exclusively at Volvos, but I would much rather have an equivalent BMW 3 Series Touring, Mercedes Estate, Audi Avant, and okay, Volvo, why do you buy a Volvo? Well, there's a few different reasons, one of which of course has always been their incredible safety record, but as time went by, other manufacturers, through being forced into it, did also improve their safety. So though I'm sure this is still an excellent car, probably not quite as excellent as a slightly newer one. And because this is a cult car, people love these things, they're quite expensive. I mean, you'd really think, wouldn't you, for a 19-year-old car now, hard to believe, but it's true, that you could pick something like this up for, oh, what, three, four grand? <laughs> no. This one has got to be worth somewhere in the teens. They start on Auto Trader at sort of six to seven thousand pounds for higher mileage, less good examples, but there are plenty out there for 12, 13, 14 thousand pounds. Presently, there is not a single one out there with the manual for sale. The later six-speed auto is somewhat more desirable, and honestly, I think that would probably improve the car. But it's the chassis for me that really lets it down. So much of this car I like. I really like the styling, actually. Yeah, give it a thumbs up. Super practical. Plenty of room in the boot, of course. It's a Volvo, good, decent, uniform shape. The opposite to the C30, which is just the most impractical and daft thing ever. Excellent seats. It's a lovely, decent, long-distance cruiser. Only it's not particularly comfortable over rougher roads. It's also not stellar on fuel. You will achieve somewhere in the 30s, apparently, on a run. But if you want to have fun and you're driving around town, it'll be high teens or 20s. But for a young person that wants an entertaining car to drive, well, a Fiesta ST would just knock this into a cocked hat. It really, really would. If you then want a luxury car, a Jaguar is just going to be a much, much better bet. Go get yourself an old XJ or an S-Type, and you could get one of those with a V8. Here, the meatiest you ever got was a 5, because the weediest you ever got was a 5. And 5 cylinders are cool, don't get me wrong. But people then love spending lots and lots of money on modifying these things so you can hear them even more and tuning them up, which I'm told apparently is a very bad idea. And it should probably tell you everything you need to know that when Ford did eventually buy the company and repurpose this engine to go into the Focus RS, they did do significant work to re-engineer it in spite of the fact it didn't actually make any more power than this. I just can't get over how unrefined this thing is over bumps in the road. It just, it just shouldn't be. It really shouldn't. I want to like this car. I really, really want to like this car. And I've just seen it has a mini disc player and I now do like it a lot more than I did two minutes ago. But even that. Can someone explain this to me? Because I don't get it. Is it actually a bad car? Well, in the grand scheme of things, no. But I can just think of a whole bunch of other cars that you can buy for the same money or a lot less that also have nice interiors, decent engines, good styling, that drive much, much nicer than this. And I am always the first person to say that you can buy a car just because it's different. But I'm struggling to think of a way in which this is different and better. Help me out, Internet. Regardless, I remain eternally grateful to Marv for bringing the car out, and I very much look forward to driving his S80, if after watching this he lets me. In any case, if you have a Volvo that you think will change my mind and open my eyes to the wonderful world of Scandi Metal, then please do get in touch. My email address is in the description of every video. It's talk at jm.com. Anyway, I think that's enough from me for today. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.